Joining me now on this week's episode of Draft Class is someone I'm quite excited to introduce here. We have Mark Berman on the show. You should all know well from his Twitter that he is the New York Post's representative on the Knicks beat. He is a Knicks Twitter all-star, even if he doesn't love that name. And someone who, no matter how many times Mitchell Robinson tells him to relax, I am always going to say is quite good at his job. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here on the show. How's your offseason been thus far? Uh, it's been good. Uh, listen, I wish the Knicks were in the playoffs. I mean, it's been over two months since the last regular season game. But, you know, the Knicks have been active. And, you know, one change uh, this year, for the first time since 2018, the Knicks have invited the beat writers down to the draft workouts. Not every single one of them, but uh, we've been to three and we're going to be, I think, next week, there's three more. And that's a change. And that's an opening up of the media policy. They have a new guy in Patrick Reese who is trying to be better than what they've been. And what they've been in the past couple of years during the pandemic has been uh, a very reclusive. And I'm so happy to be in Tarrytown. Uh, you know, and, and talking to the players, uh, talking to these prospects who are working out, even if they're second round picks. I mean, next week, you know, there'll be a couple of days of second round picks and I don't, we don't know their names yet, but uh, who's working out. But uh, I, I'm I'm delighted that the Knicks are opening it up. It's awesome to hear. And and your excitement is just, I mean, we can tell from your draft profiles that you're enjoying getting to talk to these guys. You, you know, you put out the profile on Daniels where you spoke to his coach and then you actually get to talk to him. You know, it, it just must feel great. I totally, totally understand. Um, and those workouts, we'll, we'll get to those, but it's, it's interesting that I, I definitely noted that they allowed the media into those workouts. That is something that, uh, well, I always look at everything the Knicks do media related through the lens of they have a mastermind at the helm when it comes to media relations now and Leon Rose managing public image and relationships and things of the sort. So that's certainly an open, a welcome change and one that, you know, opens up the opportunity for, for more great reporting. I've started off every episode here on draft class though, with an opening segment that I, I lovingly call it the autopsy of, of the Knicks current young core. And I, I think it's really important to talk about, you know, before we get to who they could, should, would add to this young core, what they've already got and then where they stand on what they've got. So my first question for you um, comes in the form of a, a check in that I tend to separate our young core into two groups. There's the the quote unquote big three, very loosely used term of Barrett, Quickly, and Toppin. And then there's the other group, the, the Reddish, Grimes, McBride, and Sims group of, of all good players, but not maybe with the same flash that some of those first three names offer. And then, you know, the the reports on the other end kind of back this up a bit. Like we know they're potentially willing to deal quickly in the right thing. But Brian Windhorst had reported last season that they didn't like any of the value that they were brought with uh, or brought that was brought to the table for someone like that. So would you say that this sorting of, you know, RJ, IQ and OB being their main pieces and then the other guys, would you say that that's accurate in, in regards to how the team views these guys as assets? Well, if you did the autopsy uh, with three weeks left in the regular season, that top group would be R.J. Barrett and Obi and IQ would not be in there. They were not having great seasons, but when they got a big opportunity and Obi was starting and Julius shut it down and IQ was getting more minutes, they really took off. It was a pleasure to watch. And the biggest thing, uh, was hearing from sources saying that Thibodeau has finally been won over by Obi Toppin because, you know, Thibodeau was his harshest critic. And, you know, he didn't feel that Obi was a good enough defender, rebounder. Uh, the three point shot just wasn't falling. But, yeah. but everything that happened in the final few weeks with Obi, it wasn't just that the three point shot was falling and he was great in the open court as usual, but it was the spirit he brought to his teammates when he was on the court. And Thibodeau finally could see, wow, 
this team plays with such heart and hustle when Obi's on the court as opposed to the starting power forward who will remain nameless right now. And then IQ, again, I know rumblings in his camp. They were a little upset that IQ was getting sporadic minutes in the first half of the season and he couldn't get on track. And then he went, uh, well, he had a triple double. I mean, he had yep. games. I mean, he really looked like the the player he was as a rookie because he was going through a nice sophomore slump. So now you do got the big three, and you know, I don't know. I'm not going to nitpick and say, well, it was the final few weeks, and some teams were out of it and not really trying. And I, listen, it, they played really, really, really well. Yeah, they showed what they showed. I'm not going to diminish what they did in the final few weeks of the season. And the other guys, listen, Thibodeau loved Grimes in the draft. He loved Miles in the draft. Uh, Jericho Sims at 58, a rotation player, it looks like. I mean, that's spectacular. Uh, I'm missing one name, Reddish, yeah. I, I, I don't know anything about Reddish right now. I know Tom doesn't like him. That's what he, I know. He was that's certainly I, the Tom doesn't mystery like box. Yes, so what I saw of him was a guy who was going to have a flashy play one out of four times down the court and then, you know, not do much in a consistent way. And then he got hurt. So right. Cam Reddish, I don't know. I know the Knicks scouts loved him in the draft and, and the Knicks scouts pushed for this trade. And I've reported and was the first to report that Tom did not want this trade to happen. Yeah, it, it seemed like it, especially with the follow-up reports that there was interest from Thibodeau and maybe parlaying that Reddish acquisition into recuperating their draft pick and winding up with someone like Goran Dragic, you know, just yeah. those reports that you put out, uh, you know, just covering kind of that reluctancy from Tibbs. It, it resulted in him entrusting Grimes with a rotation spot long-term. It's kind of the no, perfect but, twist. Right. But but I think that was one of the problems because Thibodeau really liked Grimes in the pre-draft workouts and in Chicago. So he pushed for Grimes. And then when they make the Reddish trade, Tom is like, I don't have a – we're losing Knox, who's not in the rotation. I'm not bumping Grimes for Cam Reddish. I don't care that Grimes is 25th in the draft and Reddish is 8 or 9. I think it was 9 to Atlanta. Right. So it, it was one of those stubborn – listen, he is stubborn. And he has his opinions, and it's tough to make him budge. But he was not taking Grimes out for Cam Reddish. Absolutely. I wanted to follow up uh, in regards to you, you know, kind of opening up a bit about those inclinations from Thibodeau. He informed some sources that, hey, man, you know, I, I you mentioned on the, the Knicks Buzz podcast in April that Thibodeau had mentioned to some sources, hey, I uh, I could have played OB and quickly a little bit earlier. I do think that something that is overlooked in the discussions about that from the camp of fans that I'm certainly part of that was pushing all season for him to play those kids more is what he does for their development behind the scenes. You know, people have put out articles talking about the early group, you know, the young group and how many hours he puts in, which is what makes the concept of him not entrusting them with minutes even more fascinating to me. Do you have uh, any more insight behind, you know, Thibodeau putting in all those hours with the young guys, but then when it comes to those in-game situations, just finding himself unable to trust them, you know, to the point where you reported the front office kind of had to tip their hand and have him play Jericho over Nerlens uh, to name an example. Well, putting in the hours, that's what Tom Thibodeau is. He puts in the hours on everything, whether it's watching the game film twice or three times or working with the young guys before practice. I mean, his life is basketball. He's married to basketball. As the expression goes, people, when they talk about Tom, he's married to basketball. He's never had a wife. And so this is his, his life uh, until he retires. So uh, you know, it's not surprising to me that he was working so hard with the young guys, but the tradition is that he doesn't trust them until he trusts them. And Obi just did not show enough in practices. You know, I, he was out of a position a lot on defense. And unfortunately, Thibodeau just could not embrace a Julius Obi 4-5 situation where really Randall would be the five and Obi would be the four because that would have opened up the minutes for Toppin. So if you're going to play more Toppin, you're just reducing Randall's minutes. Randall took him to the playoffs a year before that. He was still 
riding Randall, hoping he'd turn it around, hoping he'd get that confidence back. And for a few weeks, starting on that West Coast trip, you know, Randall was unstoppable. That Sacramento so, game, especially. Yeah, right. Uh, and really, the whole, I mean, he was scoring 25 to 30 a night. So it was tough to fit Obi and Randall and give Obi the proper minutes. And everyone wanted to reduce Randall's minutes. But, but Tim, Tom knows Randall's a sensitive guy. And you start benching Randall, who knows which way it's going to turn. So he was in a tough spot. But again, down the stretch of that season, Tom had an epiphany that Obi, forget about his own skill set, he makes others better. That infectious motor that I always shout him out for having. I, I, I just, I love, I have a thing for players that bring that energy to an extent that, you know, the, the lightning bolts are spilling out the top and, and being caught by their teammates that they just, yeah. oh, hey, this guy's bringing it. I should too, you know, that that's leading by example. And that's yeah. something that the, the Knicks kind of lacked this year um, from that same power forward spot. As you mentioned, uh, we saw a 21 year old RJ Barrett step up as this team's leader in yeah. the locker room. It, it was an interesting year, but someone like Obi, I'm glad that at least Thibodeau sees now what, what he can do in terms of just the energy. Yeah, out there. You hit it on the head leading by example. And the biggest issue with Julius was he didn't lead in the locker room with his voice and he didn't lead by example on the court. And his defense was sporadic, low energy. I've written a few times that, you know, he didn't come into training camp in the same amazing shape as he was that first year. And the other thing with Julius, and I'm surprised this didn't get more play, but on that West Coast trip, Julius stopped joining the team for the starting lineup introductions. It was bizarre. He was in the back stretching and we did a story about it's his new routine, gets his blood pump pumping. So he's not standing around, but it was very odd. And for all the road games from that West coast trip on that Julius was in the back while his teammates were being introduced to the crowd on the road. And, you know, they hug and they do all the high fives and, yeah, and the, in the, the back special handshakes. I, 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 listen, I, I talked to people off the record about it. Unfortunately, I was saving the question for Julius in the final week because I knew it would be a contentious, potential, you know, viral type situation if he reacted in a bad way. Right. I was saving it toward the end of the season. And sure enough, Julius in the final five games shut it down, claiming uh, his quad. He wanted to rest. Listen, we, we know what happened. I mean, he wasn't going to play hurt. The fans were booing him. They were cheering RJ. They were chanting RJ when Julius was at the free throw line. But anyway, I never got a chance to pin pin down Julius on what was that about with those starting lineup introductions? Right. Yeah, no, definitely odd. Um, speaking about Toppin's electricity, though, just makes me want to get right to talking about another electric player, a, a a, a, a branch of Ivy that certain Nick fans want to potentially let grow in, in this here Madison Square Garden. There's been tons of chatter recently, especially in relation to the perceived trade up spots in Sacramento and Portland. And I've even thrown New Orleans out there as a team that I think is a little more interested in trading down than people might think uh, about the Knicks moving up to one of those picks. New York's new their war room, you know, I like to imagine it's just Brock Aller's brain hooked up to a projector and and the other guys start working with the numbers that he's got stored in there. You know, I have a lot of fun with this front office that I just love picturing all these funny scenarios. They seem to be obsessed with winning deals value-wise. And trading up in the draft is not really a situation where you're going to be winning value-wise. You had reported on November 18th, ahead of that 2020 draft, that they were dangling that 20 third pick as a potential sweetener to move up to number five from number eight to secure Obi Toppin as they were really high on him. Is there someone in this draft, you know, maybe their name rhymes with uh Caden Divey, uh, yeah. who you think that the Knicks would have similar interest in uh, when moving up. You've mentioned the CAA connection. Is that someone you could see them overpaying to move up for finally just lose a deal, but get their guy. Yeah. Uh, without a doubt. Uh, Jaden is, the apple of their eye in this draft. I heard about it, you know, a few months ago uh, that they really liked the kid. And, you know, he's that combo guard that makes everything 
uh, happen when, you know, he's get, he'll get in the lane, he's going to draw that double team, and he's a smart enough player to kick it out to the shooters. They love that. They, they wish that RJ was better at that. Like RJ, yeah, he, he rolls into the lane and he's sometimes unstoppable, but when he gets doubled and triple teamed, he doesn't know what to do. He tries to fight through it and force a shot and he gets blocked or he misses wildly and it's a transition the other way. So th- that's the concern with RJ. And Tom would talk about that. It's like we need RJ to read the game better, uh, re- uh, r- make the rim read as his expression is. But Jaden Ivey is the player. They interviewed him in Chicago. So he's projected a top four pick to interview him in Chicago to waste one of your interview slots on a player that's out of your range by a lot. That shows that, you know, they have their radar on getting up there. And with CAA probably wanting him in New York City, I mean, you're not going to make a bigger splash than winding up with the Knicks and filling their vacuum at point guard. I think that's what happened with Obi. We thought he'd go five. He's a CAA guy. Somehow he slipped to eight. I don't know how that happened, but he slipped to eight. Leon never had to make the trade. So we'll see if Leon could get up there. There's, I mean, overpaying. I know the fans would go crazy in angst if they traded quickly to move up the seven spots. But, I mean, if if the Knicks value Jaden Ivey as a future all-star, as a like pretty much a definite all-star down the road, then you do that trade. I mean, you, you, uh, Emmanuel quickly is a very strong bench scorer. He's not a starting point guard for a winning basketball team. Yeah, maybe for a 10 seed playing team, but but the Knicks should be looking at getting a special player like Jaden Ivey. I definitely think that um, there's an underrated intrigue to a quickly Ivy pairing, if it were possible, because we know Ivy is a he's seen as a two. That's not a one, but it's kind of a one and quickly is a one. That's kind of a two, but not right. So those two guys would work really well together the same way. I think people are saying, you know, say Ivy is able to fall to Indiana and and the Halliburton Ivy pairing would work really well because both of those guys are combo guards that kind of yin and yang each other's skill sets. Well, I think Ivy and his skill set, you're spot on would would, would, he would come here and and elevate the rest of the Knicks young core. He would come here and help RJ face less pressure because he'd be taking it he'd be tilting the defense and allowing RJ to drive, but that improved free throw rate was fantastic. But if he could be driving to the rim at a uh, weak side rim protector, you know, the four and the, the five is already trying to stop Ivy on the other side of the, I mean, you're just looking at free points with it, RJ's it grown nice. man body. And yeah. yeah. So I do think personally, I think Emmanuel quickly, it, it'll be situational, you know, to use a Thibodeau glossary term, uh, regardless of, you know, who's out, who else is on the bench, but in the starting lineup, if there's a jumbo initiator, I think quickly could certainly start going forward. I, I project him as someone who can be a starter or potentially more, but that's, I'm also just very high on him personally. Well, I would understand if the Knicks decision makers didn't show. Well, it's him. only because there's only a certain amount of players that have like legit trade value when you go to 11 to four that's a big jump so like i mean do you want to give up obi toppin when you uh are a little concerned about julius randall's mental stability right now no definitely not right so like what are the trade pieces yeah i mean you could give your dallas first round pick next year but it's going to be the you know the maverick should be solid next year it's going to be in the 20s that pick uh, maybe a 25th pick. So I, I don't know if Dallas's first round pick for next year is going to get you 11 to four. Right. It's not necessarily some golden egg that teams are fighting over. I do think though, and I've made this point on, on previous episodes of the show. So my listeners are familiar with this line of thinking that um, I would prefer to do draft picks and someone like Grimes than I would quickly. And just because I think that, regardless of what other teams think of quickly with my personal evaluation, it would be selling low. And if you can substitute that, of course they have a surplus in a first round picks, you know, say it would be 11, the Dallas pick Grimes and reddish to move up to seven. That could be a lot, but I would rather give that up than 11 quickly 
and McBride or something yeah. like that. See, so. I will say with Reddish, there are some teams that consider him an asset and some teams couldn't care less about him. I mean, he's right. going into the final year of his contract and you still don't know what kind of player he is. So is well, Reddish- Atlanta, Atlanta determined that a heavily protected first round pick and right. Kentucky star, you know, Calipari favorite Kevin Knox would be better right. than, than him well, on the roster, which I think says something. He demanded a trade, but like I think Reddish's trade value is not as high as it was when the Knicks made the trade in mid-January. He got hurt. He didn't play that well when he uh, was healthy for the Knicks. And, you know, Team C, like Thibodeau, didn't trust him. So a lot of peop- a lot of GMs in this league really trust Tom Thibodeau. And if Tom didn't think he was good enough for the main rotation, that says something. Yeah. I wanted to ask a similar question uh, in regards to Julius. I'm sure there are several teams out there as in 10 plus that probably want absolutely nothing to do with him. So I, I can understand that. I also think that there's a world where a team like Portland might view him as a player to acquire and take a shot at with Damian Lillard. If they're really going to go try and contend out there, Dame on the wrong side of 30, they're running out of time to an extent, finally gave up on the McCollum pairing. Do you think that Randall can be utilized as positive value to help with the trade up with maybe with a team like Portland or even some of the other vets they have log jams with, you know, bringing back both Burks and Fournier might be rough, but if you can deal one and bring back the other, you can sell that. How do you feel about that? Yeah, Randall has a lot more trade value than Fournier. Uh, yeah, a team like Portland trying to get Lillard. I mean, Lillard was at the draft lottery sitting on the day, so he's buying into this remodeling. And to get a solid 20-point scorer like Randall, uh, I think would, would make Lillard happy. Listen, playing in New York is very difficult uh, when you're the star. And all the pressure is on you. And if you don't perform at a star level, you're going to hear it from the fans. You're going to especially hear it on this social media. Nick's Twitter is rough. And I know more than anyone because I get the brunt of a lot of it. But so Randall is very sensitive. Portland is a, a one team town. There's a lot of pressure there for the players, but they're very supportive. They're not booing you at the, the former Rose Garden. I think it's called the Moda Center now. But yeah. You don't get the booze, and I don't think you get attacked on social media. The Blazers fans are very supportive. A little more uh, chill. Think, yeah, exactly. And I think I think Randall could use a change of scenery. Listen, maybe he has one more season to prove himself and get back to that star level, but I could see a trade to Portland being something that makes sense for both squads. Yeah, I think you're right to say that. Um, both Randall and New York could benefit from a change of scenery. You know, I... Maybe, and you've reported that the team is very aware of the the social media reaction, the fan sentiment towards Randall, that just maybe because of the pressure of New York that not sailed, but the ship is drifting. The ship is drifting off slowly, and then it may be too late to save. Well, it's, and I, Randall took it personally that the fans suddenly, RJ Barrett became the number one guy, the guy they were chanting his name. Again, that night when Randall was having a good game and he went to the free throw line late and all of a sudden the fans to stick it to Randall, and this was after the thumbs down gesture, they right. started chanting RJ's name. And that, that could have broken him. I'm telling you, Julius is, again, sensitive and it, it, it was tough. And, and I wish Julius and his wife would stay off social media. His wife. Kendra loves uh, the social media, the Instagram, and she's gotten into it with me even once. I, I wish I wish a lot of Knicks players, would, and we started asking them about it uh, late in the season because Thibodeau made it an issue. He said that the social media thing is can divide our team because right. fans are siding with one player over another and it's not healthy. And I'm hoping next season that Tom tells these guys I know they're adults, but he says, guys, you could go on social media, but don't pay, pay attention to it. Don't let it affect you. My advice is to stay off it. I remember very well being at a game at the Garden where one Mario Hazonia 
blocked LeBron James and reading your post game report about how coach David Fisdale took Kevin Knox over to LeBron and the, the advice that LeBron had for him was stay off social media. So was, this, yeah. this comes full circle for you, Mark. I, I remember that article exactly. And, and wow. being at that game and yeah, that's uh, that's certainly a point here in New York that even coaches like Fisdale have tried to hammer home with their young players. Well, funny think- you say that because uh, you think that LeBron and, and Fisdale had this great relationship. And it didn't matter. Darvin Ham fired him right away. Yep. I'm no longer with him. Never, it never dawned on me. It's like, wow, Fisdale got fired and LeBron let it happen. But now- Darvin Ham was given full control of his coaching staff, unlike Tom Thibodeau. Now there's the rumor that that Dwayne Wade over in Utah might be campaigning for for Mr. Fisdale to to take a stop up there, which Nick fans are rooting for because their theory is that's what would finally force Donovan out of town, which I think is just golden. Um, but aside from that, I think uh, you mentioned it earlier. The obvious conversation to travel to next would be one surrounding the the three guys they brought in for workouts and allowed you guys to talk to in Daniels, Washington and Branham. I, I have a couple of quick questions. One uh, that I have a running theory that these are guys that they've kind of decided they don't love at 11 or uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, on SNY with uh, just this morning, <laughs> you mentioned that Ty Ty might be someone that they like in a trade down. You know, and instead of at there at eleven, um, you know, with Dexter Henry on on S N Y, do you think that with the S N Y New York Post? Yeah, the the the, the, the collaboration, <laughs> um, the like the New York streetwear brands when they get together and do the right. that's that, this is my version of the <laughs> those big collaborations this is what I enjoy. Do you think that that tie tie experience uh, rem- reminds you a bit of of William Wesley taking out Kyra Lewis to dinner and making a big thing out of that? And we found out okay, maybe the Knicks were interested in trading back up for Kyra, but not at 11 where they're going to take him over top. And what, do you think this Knicks pre-draft process is more to change their perception with agents and players, maybe doing Ty Ty in Kentucky, a solid, giving him a nice time, even though they know they're not picking him. I, do I have my tinfoil hat on or are these guys that they're allowing the media to talk to people that they've decided that they don't really love at 11? Uh, no, I think they, I think Ty Ty, they don't love at 11. Uh, I, I think I think Calipari hasn't banged the drum enough on Ty Ty. I got that sense. But I will say that Dice, uh, that Daniels and Branham are on the radar. The Wesley thing, listen, the, the night, listen, this is why Wesley's there. I mean, Wesley's not a scout. I mean, he's a schmoozer. He's the behind the scenes relationship guy. And even if you don't draft Branham, or Dyson or Ty Ty, they met Wesley and down the road, there could be a trade scenario and, or a free agent. I mean, it's all about getting the Knicks to be in a favorable light with these new players coming into the league because the Knicks image, because of James Dolan really has taken a hit and Kevin Durant loves to, you know, stick it, uh, stick the needle in, to continually mention how what the Knicks aren't cool anymore. He Wesley's does love trying, it. Yeah. Wesley's trying to make the Knicks cool again. And so this, you know, it was a little surprising that he took six guys out to dinner and I don't, Leon Rose was not there. It was just Wesley and the six prospects, but you know, that's uncle that's Wes. Yeah, exactly. They and, got a, they got a night out on the town with uncle right, Wes. Totally. And like, and, and they saw the game. They, they, uh, they saw the finals game one, I believe, or game two. I can't remember. And uh, and then the anecdote from Tai Tai was, you know, Wesley war- ordered like everything on the menu and made us try it all. So and it was a great experience for the kids. Almost a little Phil-esque there if he had ordered some octopus. <laughs> that would have that been good. You have an amazing memory. <laughs> everything you are amazing. I have Every, to say, Chris. thank you i appreciate it I, everything about this team i uh man i could i could tell you what shoes quick was wearing on opening <laughs> night <laughs> there are a couple other names i wanted to bring up just uh just three more prospects before i let you go i know i don't want to take up too much of your time the first i'll bring up in a pair because i think they represent a 
different draft philosophy, but they're each a direction the Knicks could go in. There's Johnny Davis from Wisconsin. There's Tari Eason from LSU. Um, one, you know, a, more of a sure thing he's seen as, as in, in Davis and Eason more of a gamble, a bet. You're bringing a lottery ticket to the table and, and hoping to cash in. There's also been some rumors. I've talked about them here on the show that Eason is not exactly killing his workouts with teams, that they're not walking away ridiculously impressed. But I, I make the counterpoint that he's not a one-on-none player. He's a guy who shows his skill, his defensive instincts in live action sets in making those deflections that only Cam Reddish really was able to make for the Knicks team this year. Those, Hey, my arms are twice as long as you thought. And that ball is mine now kind of play. Do you think that if the Knicks had both Davis and Eason on the board, that because of directionally how they've gone so far with Rose, you know, the combine scrimmage meaning a lot to them quickly, his combine shooting drills went well. Grimes combine shooting drills went well this year. They have Jalen Williams, you know, goes seven for eight from the field with coach Darren Urban as his head coach, you know, with guys like Davis uh, reminds me of Williams, a bit more of a sure thing. And then Eason a gamble, which direction do you think you could see them going in more? Do you think they think this is going to be their last time in the lottery and they should take a gamble on someone like Eason. How do you feel about those two guys and how the Knicks might feel about them? Well, one of the issues with the Knicks is everyone has a different idea of what we should do in terms of win now or let's build something slowly. So Eason is more of the build slowly. That's another thing with Jalen Duran. We haven't written a lot about him. I'm told that I doubt the Knicks are going to take a project, especially at that position, the center position. So Eason is more of a project. Davis looks ready to, you know, plug in and play. Good defender. He's supposed to be a better three-point shooter than his percentages at the combine. He told me that's not indicative of how I shoot the three. He was getting a lot of attention. But I think the Knicks are more after the sure thing with Thibodeau as their head coach right now. Uh, I, I think. It will be Brock Aller who will say, hey, maybe we can trade down four notches and get Eason and get another early second round pick or something. And I love him for it. <laughs> right. But at 11, Eason is definitely a a, a, a stretch. Um, but yeah, it is interesting about the philosophies of, say, an Aller and a Thibodeau who, you know, it's been reported that they don't always see eye to eye on everything. The hinky uh, bit? That got yeah, reported well, right. yeah. might have been we had it in our my favorite by your own. Yeah, it was a great line that he calls him behind his back, Hinky. I never denied it, really. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I didn't think he would. <laughs> yeah, he kind of downplayed it when he was asked about it, but never quite fully emphatically denied it. The the Julius answer about Scott King and the laptop. Oh, yeah, we're, but we're friends, you know. <laughs> yeah, it happens all the time. There's always yeah. a bench blow up that we never see. Yeah, um, just, just behind yeah. the scenes. So, yeah, Eason and uh, Davis on the board, I, I got to say that uh, you know, I, I think they're going with a Wisconsin player on that one. You threw me a picture perfect Dwayne Wade to LeBron James alley oop with, with what you mentioned in terms of the now and later, because there's one prospect, the guy I was saving for my final question for you here on draft class that I think is the perfect combination of now and later for the New York Knicks. And that is local product, Stepanak's own AJ Griffin. Now that's someone who wouldn't have any problems with the allegedly dreaded Tarrytown practice facility. I think he would be happy to spend time there. Do you think, first of all, that he falls to 11? And if he does, would New York be interested? We saw the photos of Thibodeau shaking his hand, shaking his father's hand, getting to meet them just in passing at the combine. And given that he's my personal favorite potential selection for them, if he makes it to 11, I was wondering yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that picture was probably at the lottery. Uh, I know I was talking to the father and AJ for a little bit. Um, unfortunately, AJ decided to blow off his media availability the next day. Otherwise, we would have tried to interview him right then and there. But uh, yeah, so Tom knows the father pretty well. Uh, we were thinking that Griffin was, you know, not falling to 11, but now we're starting to wonder because, you know, you got Dyson Daniels who has shot up the charts. And I mean, it looks like Matherin and, and, and 
Jeremy so Sohan could be going before eleven. So right. the odd man out when you, you know, AJ Griffin has not yet worked out for the Knicks. I believe I don't know this for sure, but I have a feeling the Knicks did interview him in Chicago. I haven't reported it. It's just my gut feeling that they, I know that I was told they did interview a few players that were out of their range, but Jaden was the one that that I reported and confirmed. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, it would be an interesting selection for the Knicks and someone that we haven't written a lot about, but maybe next week he'll be in town. I don't know that for a fact, but with three workout days next week and uh, one big name. Right. And they haven't, they haven't let you know of the gotcha. second round. And yeah. So you guys they actually let us know the day before who the players are. And then we're sworn to secrecy that we can't tweet it until we actually arrive at the facility and talk to them. And then we're allowed to put it out. It's, no pressure to prepare your questions in under 24 hours, right? Mark? <laughs> right. No, no right. pressure on you. Well, yeah, but the Knicks just, you know, the, the Knicks do things in an odd way. But it, we're just grateful that after uh, several years of not being invited, we're back. Back in the building, back in that oh so infamous Tarrytown practice facility. Mark. I have to thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and deal with my questions. I really appreciate it. Are there any articles, potentially your latest piece on Malachi Branham that you wanted to plug to my audience before you signed off? Uh, yeah, well, uh, we did Malachi's. It's on the website now. We'll be in tomorrow's paper. And then my next newsletter drops tomorrow morning. And I'm not going to reveal exactly what the topic is, but it, it will, I think it will draw a little bit of uh intrigue from Knicks fans pro and con so there will be a, a wide range of uh uh opinions about what it's going to be about well you heard it here mark bourbon plans on setting fire to Knicks twitter <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> maybe i know we'll, we'll see i know you're excited for your mentions to blow up i uh I look forward to that. <laughs> you, I, I can only imagine, like, you must have like, a, a, a pillow cased box that you, you hit tweet and you just throw the phone in and step away. You know, it shakes around in there like a wild animal with all the <laughs> meshes going. Uh, I can't wait. And I thank you again for your work as always and for coming on the show. I really appreciate it.